for sticking it out with me. Um, last talk before no more 15 minute talks for a while. Um, I'm going to be talking to you guys today about the role, well, preliminary analyses, I should say, about the role of hummingbirds, bats, and mountains in speciation in Bolivian Central Pogon. And this is work I'm finishing up right now as a postdoc at Missouri Botanical Garden and University of Missouri St. Louis as an NSF postdoc. Um, I'm wrapping up because I'm going to be starting a lab soon. So if maybe you're students and looking to go to grad school, especially if you're looking into PhDs, you like the neotropics, you like botany, you like phylogeny, you like hummingbirds, come find me. We should talk. Okay. Now to the story. I'm going to talk to you guys today about um, the Centropagonic clay, which is a group of 550 or so species within the Labelia or Labelioidae. The Lobelia subfamily of the Bellflower family, Campanulaceae. This is an Andean centered group with ecological and morphological variations in spades. So, here you see just some examples of the floral morphology in this clade. Uh, it, it's really quite spectacular. Now, recently, we've showed that the rapid diversification that characterizes this clade has been driven by a complex interaction of abiotic and biotic factors. And most relevant for this talk, it seems like rapid speciation is correlated with the uplift of the Andean Mountains in South America, as well as specialized relationships with vertebrate pollinators, in particular hummingbirds and nectar bats. Uh, even more recently, as in this past week, a uh, paper came out in Evolution showing that pollination syndromes are supported in this clade. And here I'm showing you bat pollinated flowers in green fall in a separate region of morphospace than hummingbird pollinated flowers in white and pink. And bat flowers tend to be uh, wider, they have wider openings and have larger anthers, are two key traits. And up at the top, hummingbird flowers tend to have narrower openings and smaller anthers. Pollination syndrome evolution has been very dynamic in this clade with about 25 shifts between hummingbird and bat pollination. And these shifts have happened in both directions. Um, with very little bias and directionality, there have been many sh about 13 shifts from hummingbird to bat pollination, but 11 back evolutions to hummingbird pollination. But despite um, this dynamic nature, we see no difference in diversification rate between bat and hummingbird pollinated lineages. And these macroevolutionary patterns that I've identified are motivating the work I'm doing right now at a, at a smaller phylogeographic scale. But all of the research I will mention today, or will mention by the end of this talk, is motivated by this question. What roles do pollinator shifts and mountains play in speciation within the central carbonic clade? Right now, I'm focusing on a subclade called the Peruvianid subclade. It's a monophyletic group of about 25 species, and it's distributed throughout the cloud forests of the central Andes. So this is Peru and Bolivia. They're robust plants, like my height, maybe twice my height, shrubs generally, and they have large flowers that tend to be either white or red, which led us to think that perhaps pollination, pollinators have shifted a bit in this clay. In particular, I'm focusing on these three species, Centropogon incanus, Centropogon mandonis, and Centropogon bretonianus, shown here. After a day of field work, they've been in the car most of the day. So they're a bit worse for the wear, but it's the only picture in which I have all three species. And I hope you can see that Incanus has white flowers that have wide openings, Mandonis, red, a little bit narrower. Um, and Bretonianus is kind of interestingly in the middle. It's cream colored, but mottled with red. And it has a wide opening, but when anthesis begins, its corolla lobes are sort of held together. And so we hypothesized um, broadly that Incanis and Mandonis, which have, um, would be bat and hummingbird pollinated based on their morphology, and that maybe Bretonianus was a generalist. These three species are all endemic to Bolivia. One species, Centropogon Bretonianus in yellow, is particularly narrowly endemic. There's only one population, and it's in the cloud forest outside of La Paz, this area called Chuspipaca. Uh, where it occurs, it occurs completely sympatrically with Centropogon mandonis, which um, has a wider distribution, stretching from north of Lake Titicaca and through Santa Cruz, but all around like the same elevational band in 
plow the forest. Uh, these are high elevation taxa, so about 3,000 to 3,500 meters, you can see these guys. Uh, unlike central Balkan and Canis, which is occurring a little bit down the, down the mountain, about 2,500 meters or so, that's to be where it's happiest. And it's also only found really in the cow forest outside of La Paz, uh, that has a wider distribution, a few more mountain, mountain slopes than Bertonianus. So we set out to document the pollination biology of this claim, and to do that, we set out to the field this past December and visited two sites, Valle del Zongo and Chusquipata. And there we collected a whole bunch of floral data, including um, color data, we quantified it using spectroscopy, we captured the scent, we're waiting to get GC mass spec results back to see what compounds these flowers are emitting to attract bat pollinators, maybe lots of sulfur-rich compounds. We made more morphological measurements to put them in the context of the bigger clay, like I should in the intro. But what I'll mainly be talking about today are these diurnal and nocturnal pollinator visitation observations that we made. Um, and we also quantify pollen transfer, nocturnally and diurnally, to see um, about what, what efficacy of pollination is happening at the day and at the night. This field work is coupled to molecular work. We have target capture or hide seek based um, phylogeographic data. We wait, are waiting to get the full data set back from rapid genomics. <coughs> Might be familiar to some of you guys. But um, we do have uh, preliminary data, and it is really interesting, and I'll present that today. Uh, but before I talk about that, I just wanted to show you guys some videos because this is so cool. This is like, I got into plant systematics because so I really like pollination, but never thought I'd actually be a pollination biologist, so this is fun. Um, here I'll show you central pogon and canis, which we hypothesized would be bat pollinated, being pollinated by a bat. Um, I want to just explain to you, so these flowers are typical of elioid flowers. They have a staminal tube at the top, basically that hairy caterpillar at the top of the flower is the anther tube, and pollen shed into that anther tube as the style grows up through the staminal tube. Um, pressure is created, and it's basically a pumpkin piston mechanism that's released when a bat touches those hairs, or a hummingbird, or whoever, or if I touch it with my finger. Um, and so that's black and white. I know it's hard to see maybe, but that's right about here on this far. And I just wanted to show you guys what hummingbird pollination, or I'm sorry, well, and hummingbird pollination, uh, but that pollination looks like. Oh, 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 three times. And most definitely that pollinated flower. Wow. You can tell that it was hitting those anthers. <laughs> Pretty cool. Uh, we also saw hummingbird visitation. It was kind of frequent, but I, you maybe you can't tell it's not doing such an awesome job that <laughs> is touchy. It's an offensive visit, but it's not like ramming into it. It's going to visit this flower if you can see it here in a second. And for those of you who study the hummingbird pollination, you know they're fickle pollinators, and it's definitely not touching the anthers here. It's like entering from the side, which is super common at this species. So, um, that's what pollination sort of looked like and what we hypothesized to be a bat pollinated flower. Um, and now on the other end of things, here's some Progama endonis, which we thought would be hummingbird pollinated. And we did see visitation, though, so that was awesome. <laughs> not, not, not a rock star touching that stuff. <laughs> uh, show it again. It's okay. I think it makes contact. I counted this as an effective visit, but it's not amazing. <laughs> Surprise to us, that's a really they do a good job at this far. Um, they are definitely touching the reproductive organs. So after watching 243 hours of video, <laughs> and 102 total visits, I can tell you that these three species of center pogon uh, form a gradient from primarily bat pollinated to pretty balanced generalists. Uh, the values of relative importance of these different pollinators are shown on the far side of this slide. Bat values in green, uh, bird values in pink. And that, this metric is based for the moment on, on the combination of the number of visits per hour by each pollinator class, as well as the percent of effective visits, so how much they actually touched the, the 
the reproductive phase. And we see that sort of as we predicted, since Polon and Candace is primarily um, bat pollinated, about 94% importance from bats as compared to hummingbirds. So the program Britannianus, again, as we sort of expected but weren't really sure about, uh, is a generalist. You see about 70% of the pollinator import coming from bats, but another 29 from hummingbirds. And Mandonis is sort of really cool, not necessarily expecting this, but it's a pretty balanced, specialized generalist, I'll say. Um, about 50% of the relative importance of pollinators comes from bats, another 44 from hummingbirds. So it's definitely relying on these two classes of pollinators. And if you want, ask me about some from over 20 years, at, at, later tonight. I think something really cool is happening in it, but I won't get a chance to talk about it. Okay, um, I just wanted to put these three species into the context of that PCA I showed at the very beginning. And um, what you see is that all of these taxa um, are falling within the green blob of morphos space, which are solidly uh, bat pollinated. And I should say that they were all predicted via lin linear discriminant analysis to be bat pollinated, despite the fact that our proxy for bird pollination in this evolution paper we have out is red, or so, or flower color. So we predicted this would be a bird pollinated flower. So it's kind of interesting. Centropogum and Donus looks like it's an exception that's proving the rule. Its morphology is putting it within that morphos space, but its flower color may be playing the role of attracting a pollinator that does a really good job of ensuring reproductive success for this group. Um, I want to just quickly put this in a name here. It's an astral tree species tree, fresh off the cluster, from um, 680 gene trees, nine Peruvian and taxa, and one out group, named after Tina Ayers. Um, I just want to point out that in the broad Peruvian subclade, we have geographic signal. There's a Peruvian clade here, and I didn't talk about those guys, but these are Peruvian and a Bolivian clade, which suggests that maybe at the broadest level of this subclade, mountains have played a role in stru structuring the uh, phylogenetic pattern in this clade, and perhaps it's this, the really heterogeneous topography in this region is, uh, limit, is limiting gene flow. Now to zoom in to the Bolivian taxa, we find that Centropogon bretonianus and Centropogon mandonis are sister species. Uh, again, these are our generalists, and they're occurring sympatrically at high elevation. Uh, sister to, they're sister to a monophyletic Centropogon and canis, our bat pollinated taxon with which they are parapatric. Which, this is a really interesting result, and the logical questions that follow are the ones that we were planning on attempting to ask anyway, which is, how did this diversity arise? Uh, and so our current efforts <coughs> are focused on generating population target capture data um, from across the range of these three species using both field collection and herbarium samples. And that's what I said, we're still waiting on our data. Um, and, but we want that data to ask two broad, oh, when I say sympatrically, like, I mean it. <laughs> um, we're referring together. So we want to ask, how did speciation proceed in this, in this group? We first, towards that end, want to apply phylogeographic methods. We're currently really excited about FRAPL, which is a program that will allow us to compare multiple phylogeographic models, including those which allow speciation to occur in the face of gene flow, which I think is going to be important in this group. Um, we also want to know how species boundaries are being maintained in these taxa. Uh, with the molecular data, we'll be able to address whether or not polyploidization or hybridization have played a role in the evolutionary history of these taxa. We also have an ecological hypothesis that we want to test as well. Um, the two sympatric taxa have really different um, statement lengths, with Bretonianus being long exerted, Mandonis more short exerted. And that is seen really, I've seen it in the field in Sympatry, and then looking through specimens at Missouri Botanical Garden, it seems to be that Mandonis is short exerted across its range as well. But we wonder if these two different stamen lengths may be contributing to 
um, reproductive isolation and two tax over reproductive isolation is incomplete, or um, whether or not it's just character displacement that limits hetero specific call and transfer. So more on all of these questions next year in Minnesota. Uh, and with that, which is just asking, the research was funded by the St. Louis Zoo. I was funded by NSF, and Missouri Botanical Gardens herbarium collection was integral to this research. I just presented field work, but all of that was based on what I know from herbarium specimens and has been augmented and improved by data from herbarium specimens. And of course, the field work takes a community. So I have to thank the people and institutions in Bolivia that help me with field work and field work logistics. So thank you. It's the last talk. We can have a few questions. <laughs> so your postdoc advisor is a bat person, right? He's a bat person. Did you guys think about trying to track bats and see where the pollen is being deposited? That would be great. We definitely don't have the permits to do that, um, but we would love to. So down the line, when we're testing that hypothesis related to yeah. Stanley, that would be, he it, has done that in Burma, Sarah, and Ecuador. He has shown right. it, like, just cloud the pollen on different areas of bats' yeah. bodies. So that could definitely be a They challenge. look like they come in so violently that it would be hard for this minor difference to make much of a difference, but you never know. But you never know, and it could just be that it's limiting heterospecific gene, uh, heterospecific pollen transfers, minimizing like uh, clutter on the stigma. But it's a question mark. We're excited about it. Yeah. So you mentioned polyploidization. So what do you know about polyploidy in this Um What I know in the central programmatic plate as a whole, so if we step back. It's basally tetraploid. Um, octoploid is a risen twice, but from what we know, not in this clade. And I'm a little embarrassed to say that now that we have time seek data, we really could look to see if, if polyploidization has occurred, but we haven't had time to still really new data. But they have a propensity towards doubling their genome, so it could play a role. That's why, that's actually my favorite hypothesis because these are occurring in such close proximity and sharing pollinators that polyploidy would immediately stop gene flow, right? Reproductive isolation would evolve. Yeah. yeah. And, and also, have you noticed any dimorphism when you've been out there? Are they totally oh. oh my god, I had. And it was this kind of a sad story. So it's in the other species in Canis, which turns out to not be the start of a story, but I wanted it to be. I wrote my postdoc fellowship to study a single species. Um, this guy, this guy, uh, Central Polka and Canis, in this one area by De Del Zongo, had a white morph and a pink morph, but it was like definitely the same species occurring together. We went to the field twice in March of last year and in December, and it's extirpated. We can't find it. Um, we think, so if you go there now, the road's been widened, and there's this Canna species, Canna banii, and a fern just taken over. It's,